So my name is Michael Ryden. I'm a professor of adipose tissue research and a clin clinician as well. I'm an endocrinologist at the Karolinska University Hospital here in Stockholm. And what I'll try to talk about is the role of adipose tissue in weight loss and weight maintenance. So the following questions will be covered in my talk. What role does adipose tissue play in controlling weight? How can white adipose tissue contribute to weight regain following weight loss? And what is the impact of genetic variations on obesity and regional fat distribution? So long-term weight loss improves survival, and that's been shown quite well in the large SOS study, where you see that uh, bariatric surgery really has a great impact over long periods of time on survival in obese subjects. However, we also know that there is a, um, a, a significant relapse in body weight, um, so that even with this extremely efficient therapy, a large number of subjects will regain their uh, overweight or even obesity. So what are the factors that may influence this? Well, there could be behavioral, the, the way we eat, the lack of exercise, the environment, environmental factors, the fact that we have a very obesogenic uh, environment where we are not uh, supposed to move. We have escalators, we have uh, elevators and so on. Sleep deprivation is very important. Uh, we have occupational uh, um, matters like uh, working conditions and shift hours, which we know are very detrimental. Medications. Uh, for psychiatric diseases, for instance, but also some other neurological conditions, which are admittedly very rare. There could also be disturbances in, in the hormones or uh, in the microbiota of the gut, that is, the bacteria that we have in the gut. So what I'll try to um, tease you with today is whether white adipose tissue per se can contribute to weight regain. And when we talk about white adipose tissue and its expansion, the old view looked at fat cells like small balloons. So they were formed uh, during childhood, and then when we expand in our body weight, the size of the fat cells are the only things that, that change. The number of fat cells isn't, isn't altered. Now the new view, which I'll try to convince you of is that the growth of fat tissue is dependent on a constant renewal, renewal of cells, which involves both cell growth and proliferation. And uh, to, to keep it short, uh, the, the main result we, we showed approximately 10 years ago is that 10% of the adipocyte pool is turned over each year in adult humans. Uh, and the rate of new cell formation and cell death is increased twofold in obesity. So what about fat cell number in weight-stable adults? So here you see a, a graph where we have the age uh, on the x-axis and a fat cell number on the y-axis. If you look at lean subjects over a large span, a broad sp uh, age span, you see that the number of fat cells is very constant. Uh, and these are our own data. We combine them with data uh, obtained in children um, in a publication by Nittel in 1979. And you see here that the number of fat cells is very low when you're a small child, but it increases rapidly in adolescence and reaches a plateau somewhere around 18 or 20 years of age. Now what about obese subjects? Well, if you're weight stable as an obese, you have the same number of fat cells over, over a broad age span. But as you can see, the number of fat cells is doubled compared to lean subjects. And if you combine our data with the, the data from Nittel, you see that the number of fat cells is increased in obese children very early, and they stay higher than the lean, uh, over the lean children over the entire uh, childhood and adolescence period. So can adipocyte number be altered in adult humans? Um, here we show data on uh, subjects undergoing bariatric surgery. You see that the fat cell volume is very, very large before bariatric surgery, and two years after, the fat cell volume is uh, decreased significantly. However, the number of fat cells is not al altered at all. So that means that the 
number of fat cells can increase but not decrease and once they have been formed a new set point is set and we've shown this not only in obesity uh, following pronounced weight loss but also in cancer cachexia which is a form of involuntary weight loss. What about uh, if you increase in weight when you're an adult? So here we have uh, unpublished data where we uh, um, gathered 30 subjects that we have followed for 15 years, which is an extremely long time uh, uh, in this uh, setting. And what we did was to divide them into weight stable and weight gainers. So as you see, the weight stable subjects before in white and after, 15 years after in black, the weight stable subjects did not uh, alter their BMI to any significant degree while the weight gainers increased from a normal weight uh, almost up to an obese state. And this was clearly not dependent on increased muscle mass, it was solely dependent on increased fat mass. As you see here where the weight stable uh, subjects have exactly the same amount of uh, body fat, while the weight gainers have increased considerably in body fat. And, and these results are also corroborated by an eight-week overfeeding study in man uh, published by, by Mike Jensen's group uh, at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. So this implies that fat cell number can increase but not decrease and once they have been formed a new set point is set and that is more or less like these um, I, I would take the analogy of the plastic straps that you use around your trash cans you can only pull them in one direction uh, and it's similar with the number of fat cells and I think that's very important in understanding why it's so difficult later in life to, to lose weight if you've ever become obese. So are there other adipose tissue related factors that may influence the difficulties in maintaining weight loss? Well, white adipose tissue expresses approximately one third of all the genes that we uh, have in our DNA and it secretes over 600 proteins which we term adipokines and these adipokines can be released into the circulation and effect, uh, have effects on, on the central nervous system but they might also affect other peripheral organs like muscle and liver. And obesity leads to changes in the production of these factors which may cause damage. And one of the most um, relevant uh, adipokines is leptin and here you see, the, uh, uh, the, you see animals or mice where the leptin uh, uh, gene has been disrupted and the, these mice are called obob mice. They become very, very obese. Uh, and leptin acts, it, it's an adipocan that acts on receptors in the central nervous system where it um, downregulates appetite. And it's important to understand that leptin production is increased uh, when you increase your fat mass. So it's a, it's a way of regulating a way of eating when we get uh, fatter. If you are deficient in leptin in man, you, you uh, get very obese. As you see here, a four-year-old uh, boy with a leptin gene defect and he's uh, treated uh, for a couple of years on the right side here with the uh, recombinant leptin subcutaneously and becomes almost uh, normal weight. And this little boy was eating constantly uh, before treatment. So an important thing to understand with leptin is that it might have uh, a relevance in understanding weight regain. Here you see results from our group showing the production of leptin in, uh, in fat tissue from obese subjects. These obese subjects underwent uh, uh, bariatric surgery. They lost quite considerable amounts of the body weight. They became normal weight and they attained what we call a post-obese state. And as you can see, the secretion of leptin was uh, downregulated significantly. Now, this might not be so interesting and that's expected, but if you compare the leptin production with weight match control subjects, you see that the post-obese subjects have less leptin than their corresponding controls. And this is not only in the way they secrete leptin from adipose tissue, but also it is also reflected in the blood. So this implies that 
uh, when you attain a post-obese state, you get hypoleptinemia, which could increase the risk of, of uh, increasing your appetite. Uh, it's not only leptin that is disturbed after body weight loss. Here's another study by, uh, by a group in Melbourne where you see uh, changes in, in weight upon uh, um, a diet intervention. And this resulted in a significant down uh, loss of uh, body weight. Uh, however, what happened is that once you've lost your weight, you are still dysregulating in a number of hormones that control appetite, uh, which leads to increased hunger. So these two mechanisms, the fact that you have a, a hungry fat and a hungry gut, may um, facilitate uh, weight regain after you've uh, lost uh, body weight. So all white adipose tissue is clearly not the same. Up to 30% of people with obesity have normal insulin sensitivity. And for some subjects, even small increments, primarily of visceral adipose tissue, can induce insulin resistance. And the question is why? Now, there are several different mechanisms. One is certainly the number and the size of the fat cells. We know that uh, a phenotype where you have few but large fat cells, what we call hypertrophy, increases the risk of developing type 2 diabetes, and, and it is also linked to a strong heredity for type 2 diabetes. Well, if you have many small fat cells, that's clearly protective. And we don't know uh, exactly what governs uh, um, the, the development of uh, white adipose tissue morphology, but uh, there are clearly specific genes that we and others have uh, started to identify in the last couple of years. There are also differences between uh, different fat deposits. So um, we have the subcutaneous and the visceral deposits, which in turn are um, uh, subdivided in, in uh, sub-depots with different function. It, and it's well known that the visceral depot is very, very active and it's linked to metabolic complications. And why is that? Well, visceral adipose tissue is drained via a big vein, the portal vein, directly into the liver. So if you have an increased release of fatty acids from visceral adipose tissue, that is drained through the portal vein directly into the liver, where it uh, leads to increased, uh, increased production of LDL triglycerides, uh, glucose, and, and thereby secondary also uh, to increased levels of insulin. Increased levels of uh, fatty acids released from the subcutaneous adipose tissue has direct detrimental effects on muscle, uh, where it increases the, um, uh, the utilization of free fatty acids and thereby decreasing glucose uptake. So a constant elevated level of free fatty acids promotes an insulin resistant state. Yet another mechanism that has been unraveled in the last 20 years or so is white adipose tissue inflammation. Uh, and in this um, mechanism, um, upon uh, overnutrition, um, the adipose tissue gets, um, 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 it gets inflamed and a number of different leukocytes uh, invade the tissue and through paracrine and autocrine mechanisms induce fat uh, um, cell resistance to insulin and other uh, hormones. And these um, um, these cells, these leukocytes, might also produce uh, hormones that could have detrimental effects on muscle and liver. So to summarize, the mechanisms that promote insulin resistance in adipose tissue, I've, I've only covered a few things. Uh, upon um, expanding your adipose tissue, if you have a healthy expansion, you don't get inflamed, you don't get an insulin resistance, you don't get any fibrosis, uh, an issue I haven't covered in this lecture. Uh, your lipid turnover is basically normal. Uh, your fat cells proliferate and then di differentiate, so you get many small fat cells, uh, and you have a vascularization, which is normal. In contrast, if you have a pathological expansion, you get an inflamed adipose tissue with a lot of fibrosis, insulin resistance, uh, increased lipid turnover, reduced adipocyte proliferation, hypertrophy, and decreased vascularization. So essentially a, a tissue that works much less efficiently. And finally, what have we learned from genetics? This has been something that a number of uh, excellent uh, research groups has been working with for the last 20 years or so. 
And unfortunately, I would say that it, it, there is some sort of disappointment in this field. It turns out that even if you look um, at very, very large populations, uh, only around 3% uh, of the variations in BMI are related to genetic variations in your DNA. And uh, regarding the um, impact of genetics on, on fat distribution, whether you have more fat in your belly, uh, so visceral fat or subcutaneous fat, the impact of uh, genetics is even less, where it only explains uh, approximately 1.5% of the variations. So genetics has a limited impact on common forms of obesity. So to summarize, fat mass is determined by the size and number of adipocytes. Um, fat is in a highly dynamic state. In weight-stable subjects, adipocyte number is set in adulthood. Fat cell formation is a constant process that is increased by weight gain. Fat cell number can increase but not decrease. And one could speculate whether this, together with dysregulated hormones like leptin, for instance, after you lost your weight, uh, could explain part of the difficulties in maintaining long-term weight loss and the fact that we have this yo-yo um, uh, weight gainers. Um, white adipose tissue phenotypes associated with insulin resistance and other complications include hypertrophy, low-grade inflammation, fibrosis, altered lipid and over, and increased visceral fat mass. Uh, and the primary mechanism in, in fat that promote these different phenotypes are currently being elucidated by many, many groups. And finally, genetics has a rather limited impact on common forms of obesity. Thanks.